Hi guys, Dr. Ken Nordberg here again. It's been a while since I talked to you. Uh, first thing I want to say is uh, thank you very much for so many of the really nice uh, responses I've had to my YouTube presentations. It's really appreciated. Uh, so I had a few that were a little bit shaded, people that were wondering who the heck I am and and uh, am I some kind of a nut who has uh, decided I'm an expert about whitetails and whitetail hunting and uh, a lot of the strange things they were saying uh, couldn't be true. So I thought I'd start by setting the record straight about who I am. And, uh, you already know I'm Dr. Ken Nordberg. <clears throat> the doctor part comes from being a dentist. The rest of it comes from my whitetail research. Uh, back in 1953, when I uh, uh, enrolled at the University of Minnesota, I earned uh, three college degrees, uh, a Bachelor of Arts with a major in Experimental Animal Psychology, a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in Natural Sciences, and then my DDS. And while I was at school there, I earned money by being a senior laboratory technician uh, uh, doing work in kidney research. Um, after I graduated from college, <clears throat> I spent three years on a ship in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War. And after I returned, I became a part-time clinical instructor in pediatric dentistry at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and also being in charge of research projects having to do with rampant caries in children. Well, by this time, I was well prepared to begin doing my formal uh, studies of whitetails in the wilds of northern Minnesota. Uh, actually, I started as early as the early 1960s, and back in that time, no one ever heard of tree stand hunting. Uh, but I had a patient who told me he shot a big buck from a tree with his bow, a long bow, while sitting on a tree branch up in the tree. And I thought, well, you know, that sounds kind of interesting. I should try that. And uh, so I sat in a tree and I was kind of amazed by seeing quite a few deer while I was up there that <clears throat> didn't seem to know I was anywhere around. The only trouble was sitting on a branch is uh, really uncomfortable and a little bit dangerous, I think. So I decided that if I'm going to do something like that in the future, i got to make some platforms up in the trees. And uh, by the end of the 1960s, I had quite a few of them out there in the woods. And was that ever wonderful for studying whitetails? Uh, at that time, whitetails had no idea humans sat in trees. I had whitetails passing so close I could have reached over. You know, my platforms were only six feet up. You could reach over and touch them. I had deer feed right under my platform many times. I had whitetails bed only five, ten yards away from my platform to chew their cud. And they were once look up there to see me up in that platform. I could be standing or sitting, it didn't matter. Fully exposed. So that was an amazing time to study habits and behavior and range utilization of wild whitetails. And I learned a lot. Uh, those early studies uh, made me a stand hunter and I was an advocate of stand hunting. I used to put on seminars and write articles for magazines uh, recommending people that make platforms and sit in trees when, when hunting whitetails. I used to stand in front of crowds at sports shows and the first thing I'd say, if you want to get a big buck, you got to sit in a tree. <laughs> and there are a lot of guys that told you, you never get me up in a tree. <laughs> well, it's just the opposite today. But at any rate, I started hunting when I was 10 years old. I've been hunting whitetails now for 73 years. Can't wait for the next season. <laughs> I've been at it a long time. I'm 83 years old now. But I've known hunters, I know hunters, I got a good friend who's a hunter, 66 years old, uh, he's been hunting for 66 years, and he still isn't that good a hunter, really. Uh, just because I spent a lot of time hunting doesn't mean I'm a great hunter. 
What made me good, what made me a good hunter, especially a good buck hunter, was my research. I've been doing hunting related research with wild deer over much of America for 55 years. I've studied whitetails a lot in Minnesota, of course, but I'm also in Wisconsin and Iowa, uh, Upper Michigan, <laughs> uh, Ohio, uh, West Virginia. I spent one whole winter studying whitetails in West Virginia. In Virginia, the Catskill Mountains in New York, uh, South Carolina. Uh, for 18 years I spent th th over three months every year studying whitetails in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So I, I've studied them in every kind of habitat and every kind of situation. And so with all that I've learned an awful lot about whitetails. I don't know anybody who's done this kind of research with whitetails. My, my studies made me the very first person ever to accurately describe the whitetail rut. A three month or a four month, one week period with three separate breeding periods in it, most hunters had no idea there's that's going on out there. But at, at any rate, with all this, I've learned an awful lot about whitetails and whitetail hunting. And all through this period, I've always spent time trying to share whatever I've learned with other hunters. Uh, beginning in 1980, I've written over almost 900 uh, articles about whitetails and whitetail hunting for various outdoor magazines. During the last three decades, I've been a feature writer for Midwest Outdoors magazine. Uh, my column is entitled Dr. Nordberg on Deer Hunting. I've been a feature writer for Bear Hunting magazine for quite a few years and also a bow hunting magazine. Uh, just writing, though, doesn't make me an expert. <laughs> That's that, it's the research. And how good of an expert am I? Well, let me tell you something. Since 1990, my three sons and I have taken 98 mature bucks, uh, most of them in, well, all of them in, on public land in an area where hunting has never been easy because Whitetail numbers are low there because of an excess of numbers of gray wolves and tough hunting. But yet we managed, the, the four of us, to get just about one buck each for about 27 years. That's pretty darn good buck hunting. I don't know if you know anybody who can match that kind of record. Four guys that take 98 bucks in 25, what, 27 years, that's pretty amazing. And we're kind of proud of that, but we're good buck hunters. And I'm trying to teach you to be a good buck hunter as well. You know, part of the reason I haven't talked to you for quite a while is I've been busy trying to finish this book, White Tail Hunter's Almanac, my 10th edition. As you can see, this is no small book. This is an encyclopedia on deer and deer hunting. And it, it got, it's 518 pages long, it's got 400 photographs, all kinds of illustrations um, that teach you to be a better duck, uh, deer hunter. In this book I introduce six uh, mature buck effective hunting methods, new hunting methods. Um, now that might sound like queer words, that mature buck effective, but that means everything if you're going to be a buck hunter like we are. Uh, and what is, what does mature buck hunting mean? Well, consider this. Let's say you and I decide we're going to do some bass fishing. And this might sound like a strange thing to say, but we're going to go bass fishing. We're going to go spend a week bass fishing together. And so uh, let's say we buy a pail of minnows and we get in the boat and we go out in the lake uh, to a weed bed and we put a minnow on a hook, each of us, and cast it over next to that weed bed and sit there all day watching the bobbers. And let's say we even caught one. We caught a nice bass, and that's kind of exciting. So the rest of the week, every day, we go out there and anchor the boat in this exact same site, cast the window over there next to that weed bed, and sit there all day watching the bobbers. And you know, it was, this is kind of fun. So we decide to do that every year. Every year we go back and do exactly the same thing. 
Well, that sounds kind of nuts, doesn't it? Because most people who are bass fishermen never fish that way. There's a lot better ways, like moving around a lot and casting the different bit, uh, weed beds. Uh, there are all kinds of different ways to do a better job of catching bass. But you know what's crazy? This is exactly how the majority of American whitetail hunters have been hunting these deer since the 1980s going to the same spot every year, sitting in the same stand site year after year. And most of those hunters by today are convinced that there aren't any more older bucks in their hunting area. Something has to be done to increase their numbers. Well, why is that? Well, because eventually whitetails learn to be smart about people using tree stands. When I first shot, hunted started using tree stands, I, I, I told you about how uh, that was so great for studying and, and actually for hunting deer. Uh, my kids all took trophy class bucks during their first or second years of whitetail hunting using that technique. Well, by 1989, we were noticing quite a few older bucks were quickly identifying us in tree stands, uh, bounding away and thereafter going out of their way to avoid those stand sites whether they were being used again or not. Some of those stand sites have been there for 20 some years and deer are still avoiding them. So, uh, you know, and deer don't live that long so they've been teaching their young, uh, those have been teaching their young to stay away from that spot. It's dangerous. You don't want to go there. Go way around this way instead of passing near it. That kind of stuff. That goes on. Well, anyway, uh, so in 1990 we decided we got to start a whole new set of research to try to develop better ways to hunt whitetails. And what we developed are these mature buck effective hunting methods. Now, those methods are what make us really good buck hunters. And I will talk about that a little bit. You know, of those 98 bucks that I was telling you about, most of them were shot uh, during the first two legal shooting hours a day at stand sites never used before. Now, how many times have you been out there beginning the very first minute of the very first uh, legal hunting hour of the day in a stand site never used before? No, that's something kind of different. And probably the stand site you've been using has been used Lots of times, year after year. This never used before stand sites are the absolutely best stand sites for taking older bucks. Did you know that? Now, whenever we scout for places to hunt next, we look for eight different characteristics of stand sites that makes them mature buck effective. And one of them is a stand site never used before. Well. You can go all kind, uh, go to all kinds of places in the woods and pick out stand sites uh, that you've never used before. But is it going to be? Is it going to work? Just that one characteristic isn't good enough. Now, another one is, you know, I just mentioned that we we've taken most of those bucks during the first two uh, legal shooting hours of the day. What that means, we had to go out there in the dark in the morning and be in our stand sites before that first one started one half hour before sunrise. That's when the first hour is usually legal in most states. So we had to get out there in the dark. And we had, not only had to do that in the dark, but we had to avoid alarming whitetails along the way and the whitetails that are close to our stand sites while we're getting out there. So another characteristic of mature buck of a mature buck effective stand site is one that you can get to without alarming deer along the way. Well, that has a lot to do with terrain and cover and that sort of thing, but it also has a lot to do with just the way you walk when you're going out to the woods. You can walk in ways that alarms every deer along the way. You can walk in another way that alarms no deer along the way. We had to use that second method, alarming no deer along the way, to get to those stand sites in order to take the most elusive whitetails in America. You know, bucks 
Uh, mature bucks are bucks two and a half to six and a half years of age. Uh, seven and a half year olds are really rare. They, most of them die in the woods that, for reasons that have nothing to do with humans hunting them. Um, those are the most wasted deer there are because most hunters hardly even see them. Uh, they're so good at, uh, uh, at avoiding hunters that most hunters think there just aren't any, or there sure aren't very many older bucks in my hunting area. And yet, within every square mile, there's three to five of them, sometimes more, that we would call a mature buck. And half of those we would call a trophy buck, a nice one that you would not have mounted and put on the wall. Not necessarily a record book, but a nice eight, ten pointer. Uh, oh, gee, this and that. You know, most hunters only get one or two of those in a lifetime. They get one, and uh, it's really funny sometimes. They'll get one, especially young guys. Gee, he gets a nice big buck his first time out there. And then he thinks, now I know all about hunting big bucks. But it, there's so much to learn. And most hunters have a lot to learn. Even guys that have been out there for 60 years. When I tell my buddy Silver, he's about my age, about these things, he never heard of them before. He's been learning a lot about buck hunting from, about, by hunting with uh, my boys and I all these years. And, um, and he's taken some really nice bucks because of it. But at any rate, those, now I've told you about two things that make us really good buck hunters that never used before stand sight and one that you can get to without alarming all the deer along the way when you go out there in the dark. Well, that's still not good enough. You know, there's lots of places you can go where you can do that. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take a big buck. So hey, there's another characteristic, and I, this is really important to me. I hate hunting anywhere <clears throat> where I'm not within sight or easy shooting distance of very fresh tracks made by a mature buck or very fresh droppings made by a, a mature buck. I'll just talk about that a little bit. You know, on any one day that you're hunting whitetails, they're only going to be using about 10% of the total acreage of their home ranges. They don't wander through the whole range, home range every day. They, most of their travels are done between feeding areas and bedding areas. Uh, in every square mile, there's five or more natural feeding areas for whitetails. Five or more, and but and uh, all these whitetails, uh, most of the tra trails used by whitetails are are created by does within their individual home ranges, and there's four or five of those in every big buck's home range. Big buck home ranges are up to a square mile, sometimes two square miles in size. But there's a maze of trails in a doe home range. They're all over the place. You know you're in a doe range when you see all kinds of deer trails in the area that you're walking through. Well, they don't use all those trails every day, just certain ones, depending on what foods are available right now, which direction the wind is blowing, and whether there's hunters in the field or not, things like that, all kinds of things. But only 10%. Now, the 10% they're in today, right now, are where you find very fresh tracks and or droppings of the deer that are there. And uh, if the tracks are like uh, three and three fourths to four inches long, that's a big buck. That's the kind you want to put on the wall. That's the kind you want to get. That proves it's there. Nowadays, nowadays it's really funny that the use of trail cams. A lot of hunters are finding out, my golly, there are a lot of big bucks living in this area where I like to hunt. It doesn't make it easier to get them, but at least they know they're there. But at any rate, you always want to be within easy shooting distance of very fresh tracks and or droppings or, another one, freshly, a freshly made or freshly renewed ground scrape. Now, if you aren't there, you're out of that 10%. You're wasting your time. Now, now you know another one. Yeah, fresh tracks or droppings, uh, never used before stand site. One you can get to without alarming deer along the way. Those are three of the eight that we use every day when my boys and I are hunting older bucks. And it's all in this book. Everything you need to know about all these characteristics of 
mature buck effective hunting methods. Six of them, six new methods in here, things you need to know. No. Yesterday's hunting methods, uh, making drives, drive, you're never going to be a regularly successful buck hunter if you make drives every year. Uh, you might take a buck at a, at a certain stand site, and if you keep going to back to it, you're never going to be a regularly successful buck hunter. Now, here's something to remember. Uh, today, and we've established this without any doubt with, with my research in the last 25 years. Within, uh, well, during some moment, within the first three feeding periods of a, of a hunting season, uh, mature bucks and mature does too. There can be as tough to hunt as a mature buck. Mature bucks and mature does will find you. They'll identify you and start avoiding your stand site within uh, one of those first three feeding periods. Now there's two feeding two feeding periods in the day, the morning and the evening, sometimes middle of the day under certain circumstances. circumstances. Uh, and so what this means is within a day and a half, uh, well, by noon the first day or noon the second day, every mature buck in that square mile around your stand area knows where you are and they're avoiding you. It's a waste of time to be hunting there in that same spot more than a day or two. Now, my boys, we've learned this, you know, it happens so often within the first hour after you're out there in the woods or two. Every day they find you and they start avoiding you. So our rule is if you hunt a half day within easy shooting distance, within sight of very fresh tracks and or droppings, at a site or trail, and you don't see that buck during that half day, it knows you're there. And it's time to move to a new stand site, 100 yards away or farther, near fresh tracks or droppings made by the same buck or another buck. Now why 100 yards? Well, nowadays, when a big buck finds you, if you're just sitting in a tree, you know, you're not dangerous. You're they don't worry about you too much once they've got you uh, nailed there or pegged there. They're just sitting up there in a tree and they don't worry about you, but they aren't going to come close anymore. Uh, it's like if you had a map of that buck's home range and here he found you here, it's like you punch out an area with a radius of 100 yards that he won't go into anymore the rest of the hunting season. So every time he finds you, here's 100 yards. Might as well forget about it. You've got to move. And so, what that means is that you got to, each hunting season, you got to start out with uh, knowing that you need to be uh, using at least one stand site every day or half day you plan to hunt. How about that? Well, that's a tremendous job when you're getting ready for hunting season. There's all kinds of ways to get around and make you get a, uh, to eliminate most of the work that goes into being able to use stand sites that often. But, and that's all in the book. Everything's in there. I've never written a book like this. This is my absolutely best uh, whitetail hunters uh, on that. You know, guys, there's writers out there that have copied my title, Whitetail Hunters Almanac. They're writing books. But there's never been a book on whitetail hunting that's like this, this big and that large. This thing weighs three, three pounds. It took me three years to write this thing because of all the additional research that went into writing them. Now, here's something else to think about. And you learned that in this book. Uh, where do whitetails spend all their time on a day when you're out there hunting? You know? They spend more, almost, well, about it's true of about, oh, 95 to 98 percent of the time. They spend half their time in a bedding area, middle of the day, in a bedding area. Well, when they're in the bedding area, they're not moving, and they're difficult to see because they typically bed in dense cover, and it can be impossible to see when they're, when they're bedded. And so that's not a good place to hunt whitetails, is it? 
Well, the, the other half of the day, cut in two in the morning and evening, they're up and moving around, feeding. While they're feeding, they're up, they can move, they're moving, and you can see them. There they are, you know, see them moving. You can't see them so much when they're bedded, but boy, you can see them when they're moving. So where should you be hunting? Or you should be hunting at or near feeding areas during high season. The rest of the time, if you're out of that 10%, and if you aren't close to a feeding area, you're wasting your time. And I mentioned there are five or more natural feeding areas in, in every square mile of suitable whitetail habitat. If you don't know how to identify one, that's something you need to learn. That's something else you can learn from this book, how to do that, and where your stand should be at, at feeding areas and that kind of thing. But my boys and I, we spent almost all of our time hunting on trails very near feeding areas with buck tracks and buck dropping, buck size tracks and buck size droppings in them, or next to feeding areas. And next, you know, a lot of hunters make the mistake of, well, they, they just can't think of any other thing to do, but put their stand site right next to the edge of a feeding area, like say a clear cut or, or a farm field, they're right on the edge. Well, we've done a lot of research on that, and we've learned that your feeding, your stand site should be no nearer than 10 to 20 yards from the edge. You should be back in the, back in the woods and, or brush or whatever that surround this more open area where whitetails like to feed. So that's where we are. That's where we spend our time hunting, back in the woods a little ways with natural cover all around us and natural openings so we don't make no shooting lines. Natural opening, when you're shooting with a gun, you don't need a big, wide shooting lane to shoot a deer. You just need little, small openings and cover. And the deer gets in the opening, pow, you got them. So you, you don't need shooting lines, and they're illegal in Minnesota now anyway. But at any rate, so now you know something else <laughs> about what makes a stand site a mature buck effective, a feeding area. So now you got four of them. Now, have you... How many times, like in the last 10 years, have you sat at a, a never used before stand site that you got to while it was still dark in the morning and hunted during the first hour or two next to a feeding area in the woods? Well, until you do that, you aren't going to be much of a buck hunter. <laughs> uh, bucks are fun, uh, bucks are uh, largely nocturnal animals. Uh, they start feeding, well, most whitetails start feeding about four in the morning. And when it gets to be light, I, we're up where we hunt, we're in wolf country, the big bucks are already on their way back to their bedding areas by nine o'clock, 9.30, somewhere in that time. Sometimes quarter to 10 in there, but early. They don't hang around out there very long after it gets light. And in the evening, they don't, they're usually not active again until one hour before sunset. So, uh, th those are kind of things you need to know. But now you're getting an idea of what, how important it is to have stand sites that are mature buck effective. And never used before as, as often as possible. And a new one every day or every half day. Look at all these things. If you've never done that, you can, you, and if you don't plan to do it, you can't be a regularly successful buck hunter. Now, like I said before, you know, very few of bucks that we're talking about are ever taken by humans. And that's a shame. We're wasting the best of our whitetail crop every year. 90% of those bucks never breed. They don't contribute anything to the total numbers of whitetails in the field. And they're wasted because we aren't good enough <laughs> or skilled and knowledgeable enough to hunt them properly. And nobody would be able to figure that out before. And I've spent a good part of my life, 55 years, trying to figure out how to do that. And now I know how to do it, and I've proven it with my boys. And I've been proving many, many years now that this is right, what we're teaching you. And you won't find it in any other book, and not for a while, People are going to copy the material out of this book for, for decades in the future. But this is first now. It's the only one of its kind. 
And I'm not necessarily trying to sell you books, but I, I, I wrote this book for you, for guys like you who are dissatisfied with, with the uh, results of your deer hunting. If you want to be the kind of hunter you've always dreamt of being, or a hunter who would really dearly love to take big bucks every year, which is good for whitetail hunting because uh, those are deer that are largely wasted anyway, well, it's all in here for you to learn to hunt. So sometime when you get a chance, go to my website or um, or just go to the internet and look up my name and you'll find all kinds of information me about there. But uh, you go to Amazon, I've got, this book is an e-book on Amazon and you can review it on the internet and get an idea of all the great stuff that's in that book. And you'll just, uh, here's some Texas deer by the way. <laughs> I got, anyway, uh, so this is a start. Now from here on, I'm not going to talk about me anymore. I am going to talk about the other characteristics of uh, mature buck stand sites in future presentations here. I'm going to start talking to you about the six new mature buck effective fair chase uh, hunting methods that are presented in this book. Fair chase means no bait. In, today in this world, there are deer hunters and there are deer baiters. It's up to you what you want to do. But I'll tell you something, just like tree stands that whitetails have learned have become smart about. There isn't a, hardly a buck in America that's survived two or more uh, hunting season that doesn't know exactly how to find, identify, and avoid hunters using tree stands. They've learned to do that. They've learned to avoid um, doe and estra type lure stands. They've learned to avoid hunters using rattling antlers and grunt calls. All those sort of, sort of things. So th there's a, they'll keep learning in the future. But what I'm going to teach you these uh, mature buck effect hunting methods, they aren't going to be able to adapt to because you change stand sites every half day. They have to find you again you know, every t twice a day to, in order to be able to stay away from you. Uh, but the nice thing is. If you do it right, they don't abandon their ranges. They stay in their ranges doing predictable things at predictable places during predictable, uh, predictable time periods. They become predictable. Here's another thing you probably never thought about. You know, wherever you go in the woods, you are producing scents. They're pouring off your body all the time. And if you didn't know it, there's nothing you can buy in a store that, that can eliminate those scents while you're hunting whitetails. Uh, it's been proven recently by research with canine dogs right here in Minnesota. They, they tried everything you can, deer hunters can buy to eliminate odors, and it never stopped canine dogs one minute. Uh, they would find people that were hidden uh, using any of those things as quickly as those that never used any of those, those products. So they can smell you. And uh, sometimes it seems they can, especially, especially young whitetails, uh, lone fawns or yearling, yearlings are, they do all kinds of goofy things and they haven't learned yet how to avoid hunters as well as older deer. Uh, two and a half year old bucks are kind of in between. Uh, a lot of them are more like yearlings making yearling mistakes and a lot of them are more like older bucks, which are really elusive that you rarely see. But once they're three and a half year olds and older, they are really tough deer to hunt. And if you're not doing things right, and if you're not paying attention to using stand sites with mature buck effective characteristics, you'll never be a regularly successful buck hunter. You just can't be. And I know that. We know that. My sons and I know that. So, anyway, that's what I, was, I wanted to get off my chest here today. So, uh, I might be a guy that's saying a lot of things that are strange you've never heard of before. Uh, you think maybe that can't be right because none of the writers in outdoor magazines and other books ever say anything like this before. But no one's ever done the kind of research I've been doing. A lot of what I've witnessed all these years, uh, don't have words for them. I've had to create new terms and new uh, descriptive terms for things about whitetails that nobody ever knew before. 
I remember when I first started hunting whitetails and I, I discovered, gee, uh, the, those big dominant breeding bucks were abandoning their uh, ground scrapes the very day that those were in estrus, you know, for years and years. And even now, all over the country, people believe when they find a fresh ground scrape in the woods that those are breeding. They're not breeding. That's wrong. And then nobody ever knew bro uh, does breed during three different time periods in fall and winter. Um, that's something different too. I remember when my wife and I were finding a place in Wisconsin where does were breeding every year on New Year's Day. We always went out photographing whitetails on New Year's Day. It was a custom of ours. And we'd find does being bred during that period. This is crazy. Uh, whitetails don't do that. There's something wrong with these deer. In fact, there was an editor for Field and Stream magazine that I was writing an article for, and he was he told me about, you know, you got some odd deer there in Minnesota. Surely deer aren't like this anywhere else, are they? And that got me started studying deer in lots of other states. But what I've learned is true of deer everywhere. Now, I don't base my conclusions on what you read on a little box on something you buy in the store or on what some other writer writes in a magazine or in a book. All my conclusions are, ba aren't they? They're not crazy things out of the book. They're all based on what 80 to 90 percent of each of the five behavioral classes of white tails. There's five kinds of white tails in the woods. Did you know that? Not just one. They aren't all like yearlings or fun. There's five different kinds of white tails in the woods. Uh, but what 80 to 90 percent of them in each of those behavioral classes does 80 to 90 percent of the time under similar circumstances for periods of up to 10 years or more. This is the only way I know to establish truths about whitetails and to create better ways to hunt. It's the only way I knew, know to do it. And I don't know anybody else that is doing it this way. So uh, it might sound crazy sometimes and different. and. Uh, but I'm no one hunt expert. I'm a 73 hunt expert, and I've been, and I've spent more than a half century learning when I teach deer hunters today. So that's what I'm all about. And uh, you, if you can't remember all this stuff, there's a permanent record of all I've learned in all these years, especially since I wrote my last almanac, my ninth edition in 1996 or 77, I think. Uh, so there was a lot of research that was done, some of the best of it between 1990 and, and uh, 2017, last year. In fact, last year we learned some new things about whitetails. You know, whitetails are always changing, and that's what's so great about this. And some of the things I might have said 30, 40 years ago aren't true anymore. And the whitetails don't just don't do that anymore. So uh, that's been fascinating. I, I've loved my life. I love writing. I love teaching. <laughs> I taught the hospital core curriculum for the Navy for six years, believe it or not. I've been a teacher in school in college for many years, uh, uh, eight years. <laughs> uh, so I'm not some goof goofball out of the blue with some goofy ideas. This is the real thing. So uh, pay attention to me, you guys, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again at my next uh, YouTube presentation. And thanks again for being here.